The finding of a subepithelial lesion at a diagnostic endoscopy is a bit of a heart sick event that, according to data, happens in about one in 300 procedures. The reason I say it's a heart sink event because they're quite often incidental, they're quite often small, they're asymptomatic, and we don't really know what to do with them that's very satisfactory. And it creates a really difficult conversation with patients about the options of surveillance, resection, or simply just do nothing. So uh, this is how I approach them, taken from obviously the, the various guidelines out there. The first thing to, to, to discuss really is the initial diagnostic procedure itself, um, where one finds this incidental lesion and a biopsy. Now, very often people biopsy the lesions and always the, the biopsy comes back as essentially normal. If when one looks at this lesion, the overlying mucosa is normal, there's certainly no benefit really from taking a biopsy because this is a subepithelial lesion and biopsy in the mucosa is going to come back as normal. So unless I'm concerned about the overlying mucosa, I don't bother biopsying these patients. Secondly, really what we're worried about in these patients are, is this a gist? And of course, there are other lesions we can consider as well, but that's really what we're discussing here. And we've got a few slides here about, uh, about gist themselves. Importantly here, size does matter. And generally using the guidelines, there's about a two centimetre cutoff in terms of whether this is a low risk or high risk. So lesions less than two centimetres low risk, more than two centimetres high risk. Lesions greater than two centimetres certainly have to be referred for an EUS and one needs to take a, get a tissue sample. Generally, this is achieved by using an FNA or an FMB um, and the success rate of these is around about 70 to 90 percent, according to the, the various data that one looks at. We can discuss at another time the, the various other ways to obtain tissue, um, you know, tunnel biopsies, um, um, you know, the sink procedure, this sort of thing. But um, for now, FNA, FNB is certainly the most commonly trodden path. These patients with these lesions larger than two centimetres certainly have cross-sectional imaging as well. And the reason you're essentially doing that is because um, you want to see if there's any metastatic disease, because what we're already saying here is these lesions are potentially higher risk. Now, lesions less than two centimetres are a bit tricky. Um, it's generally thought that these are low risk and the data would support that it's very rare for these lesions to ever grow in size but we continue to survey them. Lesions between one and two centimetres certainly should be referred for an EUS, which allows us to better characterise the lesion, make sure we're happy with the size, see what layer it's from, and try and obtain a tissue sample, which either will say this is a gist and needs to be surveyed, or hopefully this is a other, other cause, a lyomyoma myoma, or whatever it may be, and they can be discharged. Now, Lesions between one and two centimetres certainly open up an interesting conversation about the pros and cons and the risks and benefits of removing these lesions using full thickness resection device, submucosal dissection, the stir technique. And we've got a lovely video from Philip Chu uh, where he removes a submucosal duodenal lesion that's certainly worth a watch. It's an, it's an incredible procedure. Um, but generally speaking at the moment, these patients are offered two yearly surveillance via a US, um, which you know, it can be unsatisfying to do, but that, that's where we are. Lesions less than one centimetre um, are even trickier, really, because the likelihood of these ever doing anything is incredibly low. Certainly, um, we can refer them for uh, an EUS. And what I would generally do is advise to refer these patients for a procedure, an OGD plus minus an EUS, in about six months to a year, because at that point you can see if they have grown in that interval and determine whether they're actually a higher risk lesion at all. If they stay below one centimetre, then it's a really tricky conversation about what are the benefits of surveillance in. Really, we don't know, but it's likely to be minimal. Probably we should offer these patients a three yearly surveillance with an OGD plus minus an EUS if possible, but obtaining tissue here is hard and really characterising the lesion here is very hard as well. So this is certainly an unsatisfying uh, area and again, opens up that interesting conversation about resection.